now we've got a situation where this worker was working in a sheet metal shop. They were using something to cut the sheet metal and got their thumb in the way and it was amputated. Now, there's a point to make here. It's easy to get distracted as a rescuer in trying to retrieve the amputated part, but we have to remember the patient is the primary focus first. It isn't that we're not concerned about the part. In fact, we may send volunteers with gloves to go and locate the part. If it's in close proximity, great. But remember, spinning and cutting devices could actually throw the part or the partial amputation quite some distance from the accident site. So it could be a little difficult. It may also be covered in sawdust or in shavings and a little hard to find. So have other people do that if at all possible or if they're capable of doing that while you attend to the patient. It's easy to get really focused on the primary injury, but what we might not realize is that they also passed out and hit their head on a heavy piece of equipment, meaning they may have been knocked unconscious and they've got a serious concussion. So don't forget to assess the patient for life-threatening emergencies as well as the bleeding issue. The next point I want to make about amputations is that in all my experience as a paramedic, not to say that an amputated part or especially a partially amputated part or a crushing injury can't bleed a lot, but most of my clean cut amputations have not bled all that much. Some of it is because of this phenomenon where the arteries actually contract up into the stump and the veins and sort of clamp themselves down for at least the first few minutes that gives us a little bit of time so that we can control that injury and the bleeding that's associated with it. So you may not see a ton of blood, but let's still address it all the same. The person is awake, they're responding to me normally, they are helping me hold pressure over the remaining stump, and they seem to have no other life-threatening injuries. So let's control this bleeding. I can see that it's beginning to leak through. I'm not going to remove the gauze bandage to look at it because that will pull the first beginning clots off. And I'm going to simply replace his fingers with the gauze bandage and ask him to continue to press while I do other things. If he can't do that or if he's starting to suffer from like some emotional shock, that's understandable. So I may have to control it or get another bystander to give me a hand and make sure they have protection on, on their hands with gloves. But a special note here, when there's been an amputation, though it could be a clean cut, sometimes you'll have bone fragments actually sticking out. And I think you need to be really careful that if you apply that direct pressure, that you don't become victim number two by poking that bone end into your skin. Not only do we not want to damage that bone fragment anymore or cause unnecessary pain and bacteria to get in there, but it's like a needle. I mean, some of those bone fragments are really sharp. So just be very careful as you're covering that bone end that you don't uh, actually poke yourself with that bone end. But now he's holding it just fine. He's doing a great job and I don't see it leaking through the second bandage. Now I'm gonna take my roller gauze and I'm gonna hold that, that dressing in place. Let me just go ahead and take your hand here a moment. And now I'm wrapping it as a pressure bandage, but I'm certainly not trying to cause a tourniquet effect. I'm really just trying to hold that pressure bandage in place. And as long as it's controlling the bleeding, it's certainly tight enough. If it begins to leak through again, I'll put more bandage on there and continue to wrap. A little special trick of the trade, sometimes if I need a little extra pressure when I come up top over the wound, I'll twist the bandage and then just bring it around. It just adds just a slight bit more torque over the actual wound site and can help control that with a little extra pressure. Now, if the person can hold the bandage or I can cut it, tape it, or I can actually tuck it underneath the other bandage. That bleeding is controlled, the patient is stable. Now let me address the next piece, which is the amputated part. Hopefully the bystanders were able to locate it and bring it to me. Once we actually have the amputated part with us, there's a few things we need to do. The first thing that I wanna do is keep it just as clean as possible. I'm also going to wrap it in a sterile gauze or bandage if I can. Now I'm using an abdominal dressing here and I'll tell you why. I like the insulation that that offers if I'm going to put it between ice or cold packs. Cold packs aren't such a big concern because they're not really up to that freezing level, but I, I do want them, the tissue to be protected from getting damaged through frostbite. 
Think about frostbite with an attached limb that has warm blood flowing through it. This little piece does not have blood throwing, flowing through it, and so its ability to freeze is actually much faster than if it was still attached to the patient. So I'm insulating it from cold damage, and if I don't keep it cool between cold packs, I have another method. The first thing I wanna do before I use the submersion into an ice water slurry is I wanna stick it in an airtight bag. So this is a sealable bag. I'm going to go ahead and seal it, fold it over, and now using some ice and some water, it does not have to be sterile water because it's not touching the water, I'm gonna now submerge the sealed part into this ice water slurry and I'm gonna seal the outside of this bag. This helps keep the part cold, but not frozen. Now, you might say, well, what's the big deal about keeping that part dry? Well, have you ever been in a hot tub, swimming pool, or bathtub too long? What happens to your skin? It tends to get pruney, doesn't it? That is because it kind of breaks down the tissues. It will do that to this part as well and can make it a nightmare when it comes time for the attempt to reattach it. Not that reattachment's a guarantee anyways, but it does certainly help if the, if the part skin is not damaged because of water contact. Now, last but not least, we wanna make sure this amputated part stays with its owner. We need it to ride along with the patient. This is probably not a good idea to have it in front of the patient. They know they just had a serious injury. They know that's their thumb, and that alone could start to develop some psychosomatic or psychogenic shock. I like to hide it kind of behind the patient, keep it out of their view, but if you're not gonna have it on the stretcher or with the patient directly, it's important that you vitally keep an eye on where it's at and remain um, diligent really about keeping the part with the patient so that when they arrive to the hospital, the surgeons can get it as fast as possible and reattach it or at least attempt to reattach it as fast as possible. Some tips and how to do that. And in the meantime, always be watching with your secondary survey for those signs of life-threatening emergencies and be sure to treat them if you see them arise.